Good morning, church. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to take it out and join me in the Gospel of Luke today. And we're going to be looking at chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Good to be together here on this Christmas morning. On any normal year, on the Sunday closest to Christmas, we will always have a lot of people gone because they are off visiting their family somewhere. And we will also have a lot of guests here because people come here to visit their family. And I think that's even more so the case whenever the the Christmas day happens to fall on a Sunday morning. If I remember correctly, the first Christmas that we celebrated here in Wichita back in 2016 fell on a Sunday morning, which would make sense because that was six years ago. And when you factor in the leap year, that's about how it takes place. But um, I am so glad to be here with each and every one of you this morning. I often say to you, there's no rather play, no place that I would rather be than right here with you. And that's true, even on and maybe especially because it's Christmas morning. Now, my boys, maybe not so much. You know, they really wanted to open those presents this morning, but we're waiting till we get home. But uh, I certainly am glad to be with you. We're going to have something special this morning. We are going to have a baptism a little bit later. Noel Reynolds, who is the son of Lisa Nichols, the grandson of Lee Nichols, is here on Christmas break, and he's going to be baptized, and we'll do that after the sermon. So I invite you to stay around for that. As we celebrate the coming of the birth of the Son of God, we'll also celebrate a new birth into the kingdom of God here this morning, and that will be something special. So I invite you to stay around for that. For the last four weeks, as we have been moving towards Christmas Day, we have focused our theme on a line from the song, O Holy Night. And it is a line that says that the weary world rejoices. And we've looked at four different texts, three of which have come from the Old Testament in order to give us comfort and kind of sharpen our sense of anticipation as we move towards Christmas Day. But this morning, that anticipation comes to its climax. As the people of Israel have waited, so have we waited. As the people of Israel have anticipated, so have we anticipated. And so not only today do maybe we get to unwrap some of the gifts that we've been waiting for, perhaps some new books that might be under the Christmas tree for me, I don't know about for you what it might be, but today we get to celebrate the great promise that, uh, well, we get to celebrate really that God has kept his promise, and that is an extra special thing. For centuries, God promised that a Savior would come. Over 700 years before it happened, Isaiah promised that a child would be given to a virgin. And that's a long time to wait. And that long time of waiting should feel similar to us because we too have been waiting a long time. We're not waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. We look back on that as we do at Christmas, but we have been waiting 2,000 years nearly for the second coming of the Messiah. But today, for a moment, we put aside our anticipation, we put aside our waiting, and we celebrate the fact that our God is a promise-keeping God. The Savior has been born, and we recognize that fact on Christmas Day. Now, it is true, of course, we don't know when Christ was actually born. The tradition of of December 25th goes all the way back to the 4th century, a long time ago, but no one's really sure how they arrived at that particular date. And over the intervening years, there are lots of different traditions from lots of different cultures that have come together to make the Christmas experience that, that we now love and enjoy. It might come as a surprise to you know that the way that we celebrate Christmas today, it's really only about 200 years old. Most of the traditions that we have, like singing carols at this time of year or sending Christmas cards to one another, that only goes back to about the mid-1800s. Now, there are older elements, of course. The Christmas trees date back to Germany in the 1500s. The the holly and the mistletoe go back to to the tradition of the northern European nations in their celebration of the winter solstice. There was gift giving as a way to celebrate the return of the sun as it as it came in those same northern European countries. And so all these things have factored in and they've filtered down to the tradition of Christmas that we now love and enjoy. Because that's the way it works with traditions. They grow, they move, they adapt. And what we have today is special to us. And we are very grateful for it. 
But even though some of the traditions that we may celebrate year after year may only be several hundred years old, the story that we celebrate, well, that is nearly 2,000 years old. And it is to this story that I want to turn our attention for a few minutes here this morning. In the six years that I've been here, I don't think I've ever just simply meditated with you on the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. And I'd like to do that here this morning. And as you can see from the screen, there's one particular element of that story that I really want to focus on with you here today. So with that in mind, if your Bible's open, I'd like for you to join me in Luke chapter 2. And uh, I'd like to just read the events that we celebrate here on Christmas morning. Join me if you would, chapter 2 in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And so everyone went to their own town to register. Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, whom he was pledged to be married with, and they were expecting a child. But while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger, all because there was no guest room that was available for them. And with that in mind, let's return to that song that we sang a little bit earlier. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they members here, you may be aware of the fact that I just wrapped up a a class for this fall on the attributes of God. And uh, I knew whenever I started that particular class, it was going to be one of the more difficult subjects that I had ever attempted to teach on. And I'm actually somewhat glad that it's over. Uh, Not because I I wasn't looking forward to it or I didn't enjoy it. As a matter of fact, I very much did enjoy it. But for the simple reason, when you're trying something new and you know it's going to be something that's difficult and is a challenge to you, you know there is this chance that, yes, it may succeed or it may fail. And the the knowledge of that tends to create a little bit of anxiety in a person. So now that it is over, whether succeed or fail, it's over, okay? What's done is done. But I really did enjoy the class. And if no one else got anything out of it, I enjoyed working through that material and and working it in such a way that I tried to present it for you. And for anyone who's ever been a teacher, you know that is often the case. But because I spent the last three months thinking about this subject of the attributes of God, it may come as no surprise to you that one of the subjects that has kind of held my attention for a little bit is the subject of the providence of God. As finite beings, of course, we cannot really comprehend a being that lives outside of time and space. We just simply do not know what an existence like that could be like. But Scripture is quite clear with us in a number of ways that this is indeed what God is like. He has created everything from the beginning to the end. And because God has created everything from the beginning to the end, and he has made all the elements that go into everything from the beginning to the end, it is also true that he knows 
everything and is the author in some ways of everything that happens beginning to end. Now, it's hard for me to comprehend that, probably hard for you to comprehend that. But I must say that as I continue to grow and to mature in my faith, it is a fact that I have learned to take a great deal of comfort in. Every now and again, God teaches me just how pervasive his providence is. I don't know if it's this way for you or not, but sometimes when I'm wrestling with a particular question or I'm asking something of God, God will find little ways to kind of drop his answers to me. Sometimes it'll come in a conversation with a friend. Sometimes it will come through an interaction with a stranger. Sometimes it'll even come when I'm listening to the television or the radio or Googling something. More often than not, because I like to read, it'll often drop to me in the way of a book or a chapter that I was not expecting. And sometimes it will just happen to me in my studies and the preparations that I do for lessons like these. And that thing happened to, to take place for me this week. This past Monday morning, I was doing some devotional reading. And of course, as I was doing so, I was already thinking ahead. I knew this was going to be Christmas Day. I wanted to share the Christmas story with you. And so I was asking him the question, okay, how am I going to present this story to you? It's a story you've heard, some of you, 150 times if you're that old, you know. And uh, uh, most of you are not that old, but some of you are getting there, you know, so it happens. And, uh, um, but it's, it's a story you've heard so many times and, and um, uh, you know, how do I approach it in a way that, that would be fresh to you? So as I was doing that devotional reading on Monday morning, I happened to be in the 21st chapter of the book of Proverbs and the very first verse just reached out, grabbed me. It is both a reference to providence as well as a very personal experience of it. Here is what Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1 says. In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is like a stream of water. He channels it any way that he pleases. That is a verse about providence. But for me this week, it was also an example of providence. Why? Because I now had my angle for Sunday's sermon. And I wasn't even looking for it yet. I love when that happens. The proverb is about the Lord's providence over kings. Kings, of course, in many cases, think they are powerful and sovereign and wise, that they control everything that happens in their kingdom. And that's true to a certain extent, isn't it? But what's God saying here in this proverb, or what's Solomon saying about God? He's saying that the king is really nothing because it is God who channels the king's heart and he turns his actions in any way that he pleases. And with that thought in mind, I want you to listen again to the opening words from our text today in Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus, that's another way of saying Augustus the king, right? Issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And so, verse 3, everyone went to their own town to register. Do you see the connection that I'm making there? At the beginning of the Christmas story, you have this man who no doubt is the most powerful king in the history of the world. He's known here as Augustus. And for those of us who know a little bit about history, you would recognize his name more readily as Octavian. Octavian was the nephew of Julius Caesar. And when Julius Caesar did not have a son of his own, he appointed his nephew to be the next great emperor over Rome. And again, this was a critical time at Roman history when things of the old republic were going away, of the new dictatorship were coming about. And so this dictatorship was going to rule much of Europe and parts of Asia for the next 200 years. Before Octavian, there was civil war, public strife. But under Octavian, through his brilliance and his cunning, through his wisdom and his political sophistication, 
he brought Rome to its most powerful and its most peaceful days. The term, the Pax Romana, was coined during his particular phrase. And so here he is, the most powerful, the most exalted man in the history of the world. But little does he know that as he acts, God himself is turning the actions of his heart. Why? Well, it's because there's this little peasant couple in a know-nothing place called Nazareth who need to find their way to another little know-nothing place, the village of Bethlehem, because the world's truly most important man needs to be born there. And that providential event creates the setting for the Christmas story that you and I know so well, that you've heard 150 times over the years. But with that background in mind, I want you to see this morning how the story unfolds. The scene begins with Mary and Joseph on their, on their way to Bethlehem. They're going there, of course, because of this decree of Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That census, by the way, was for tax purposes. And for whatever reason, Joseph's family, maybe because they own some property there or because it was the custom for everyone to go back to the place of their tribal ancestry, Joseph is bringing his little family to Bethlehem. Now, one might wonder, I wondered at least, why is Mary going on this trip? Ever thought about that? You know, can't Joseph take care of this little business in Bethlehem by himself and then come back? I mean, she is eight or nine months pregnant after all, at least we assume she is. And as we discussed just a few weeks ago, it would be hard enough for a woman at that stage of pregnancy to get on a plane, much less to ride a donkey through 70 mountainous miles between those two places. But I suppose there are several reasons why Joseph takes Mary along on this journey. Number one, it may be true that Mary is not very well received in her own village of Nazareth. While it is true that this angel was able to convince Joseph that Mary really was a virgin despite everything that has happened to her, but I doubt that the people of Nazareth so readily accepted that story. Certainly they had seen that Joseph had stayed with her, and maybe it's true that, that he had related his angelic experience to them so that they would know. But listen, it was no more plausible then than it would be plausible if someone told you that story today. Plain and simple, if a woman becomes pregnant out of wedlock, it's probably because she's doing something that would make that happen outside of wedlock. And so I doubt that Joseph wanted to leave her there alone. I would imagine that he was afraid for her safety, for the baby's safety. Another reason why Joseph may have taken Mary along is because, well, I mean, he doesn't want to miss this particular birth, right? Every once in a while it happens that, that a father is not present for their child's birth. It, it happened then. It still happens today occasionally. But listen, this is not just any birth that we're talking about here. This is not just any old baby, most fathers worth their salt are not going to miss the birth of their child, especially the birth of their firstborn child. How much more so is that true if your child is going to be the Messiah? I don't think Joseph's willing to miss that. I don't think he's willing to take the chance that he can make that 70-mile journey down to Bethlehem and back before she might have the baby. But third, and... I think most plausibly. Whenever the census came down and was enforced by the Romans, they knew they had to travel to Bethlehem to fulfill their duty. And perhaps it was with a quiet smile that they acknowledged to one another the providence of God. And you know why. We talked about it just a few weeks ago. Their own scriptures the prophetic book of Micah had said to them that the Messiah was to be born in the village of Bethlehem. 
But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old, from ancient times. Remember, Joseph and Mary were devout, faithful people. They loved God. They were obedient to the law. I'm sure they knew the law. I have no doubt they had heard that passage read 150 times over the years in their own synagogue that was there in Nazareth. And so I'm guessing it was no surprise to them that when the dictate of Caesar came down, that this would move them to the place where they needed to be. And so to Bethlehem they go. We don't know how long they were there. Uh, I know the way that this Christmas story is often told. It seems like Mary and Joseph, they're just getting to the edge of town when things start to go into motion and they can't find a place at the local inn. Now, I, I don't take any joy in learning the popular conceptions of our nativity scenes, but we do have to do that every once in a while. For example, you know, the wise men weren't there that night, right? They came up to a year or two later, and there's some other things like that. And there's probably some things about our popular conceptions of the story that are, that are not quite accurate. The passage here in Luke does not tell us how long they were in Bethlehem. It does not tell us if they had first fulfilled their duty and then just stayed in Bethlehem a while in order to have the baby. It does not even actually tell us that they tried to get a room at the inn. In some of the more modern translations, like the, the 2011 NIV that I have here this morning, they translate verse 7 in what I think is a more accurate way, at least according to those that I read, and that is there was no room for them at the guest house. It's not the same word as the inn. An inn in the ancient world, not the kind of place where a righteous family stays. Dangerous there. Filthy there, usually full of thieves and swindlers and prostitutes and people of the underworld. More than likely, Joseph had some family connections there. But listen, <laughs> their homes were not like our homes. They're not three or four or five bedrooms as some of us have. Many homes were built in such a way that, that there was this upstairs area where the family lived, maybe one or two rooms up there, and then down below, almost would look almost like a carport like we would today, but the house would be over it. Underneath there would be the area where they kept their animals, the donkeys and those sorts of things. And so it was probably in a place like that where Mary and Joseph had their baby. With the guests there for the census, there was no room for them to stay, no place for something messy like this to happen. And so the only suitable place is to be outside with the animals. But whatever the actual case, we won't know till we get to heaven and we can ask for ourselves. We are reminded of a, a very valuable lesson. God's providence is often amazing, but rarely comfortable. And if you doubt that's true, think about all the stories of Scripture in which this fact is confirmed over and over again. Joseph was God's man chosen to rule Egypt and to save his family from a famine. But how does God get Joseph to Egypt? If we were writing the story, we might like for some local you know, Egyptian official to come along and say, boy, you have an exceptionally talented young man there and he wears that pretty coat of many colors. Let me take him to Egypt and train him. And he starts at the very bottom and he works his way up until he becomes ruler of Egypt. That's how I'd like the story to go if I was living it, you know. But it's not how the story goes. He's thrown into a well, sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites, taken to Egypt, wrongly accused by official's wife, made to sit in prison for years, forgotten after his stunning ability to interpret dreams. Joseph had a difficult course. But it's how God led him to be the ruler of Egypt, the savior of his people at that time. <laughs> or how about Moses? Moses was born in extraordinary circumstances. While the Pharaoh and his government were trying to rid Egypt of all the little male babies, Moses' mother sails him down the Nile River where he ends up in the home of Pharaoh's daughter. Raised there, 
given all the privileges in the early part of his life of an Egyptian upbringing. But one day he steps in on behalf of one of his fellow Israelites who was being an oppressed by an Egyptian. He murders him, he kills him, buries him in the sand, and he's forced to run away. He spends 40 years in obscurity, tending sheep in the desert until God reaches out to him in that burning bush and says, you are going to be the leader and again the savior of my people. Or how about David, King David that we spoke about just two weeks ago, chosen by God, anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. But before that happens, for years, he finds himself on the run as King Saul tries to murder him again and again. And so before David gets to fulfill that wonderful role that God has given to him, first he must suffer in the wilderness. It's this pattern, and it's repeated over and over again in Scripture. And so we would expect it to be no different for Mary and Joseph They have been chosen for a privilege unlike anything that anybody's ever been given before. They are going to give birth to and to raise the Son of God, the Messiah. But before the joy of that fulfillment, the ways of providence lead them outside to an animal stable. And there, the king of the world, the king of the cosmos is born under the reign of Caesar Augustus. And the most important man in the history of the world before Christ, Augustus, he has no idea what has just happened in his empire. Nor does he know that his decree, his taxation decree, put the right people in the right place in order to make this happen. But that's God's providence at work. His strange and mysterious providence. And nowhere is that better seen than the Christmas story. So as we prepare to leave this morning and to go our own way, it's worth remembering that God's providence is still at work. Just as God was at work arranging all the details of the Christmas story, so also is he still at work in the lives of his adopted children today. Now, living under God's providence does not mean that everything will always be pleasant and wonderful for you. As we've been seeing, God's providence is a mysterious thing, and it often leads us to pain and sorrow, as well as joy and exultation. Fortunately, God's providence provides just enough joy and happiness to keep us encouraged for the journey, but just enough hardship and sorrow to keep us humble, keep us longing for our heavenly home rather than being content with what we have now. But I'll end this morning by noting that all of the providence that we see in the Christmas story is a providence that is given for your benefit. The reason God sent his son into the world, the reason that we have the Christmas story that we celebrate every year is because God wished to reconcile sinners to himself. And so in order to do that, he had to become a man, to live in all the ways that we live, to live that sinless life that you and I could not live. And by living it, he was able to offer it up as a sin offering so that those who share his humanity could be reconciled to God. The Christmas story is a long culmination of centuries of anticipation and providence. But what was begun with the birth of the Savior was then completed in his life and his death and last of all, his resurrection And amazingly, all of this was conceived in the providence of God before time ever began. And so that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what we remember on this special day. Whatever traditions may involve that we all enjoy every year, we can know and appreciate the basic story. Out of Bethlehem arose a king 
and a Savior whose origins are of old, whose life is everlasting. Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are to be here together on Christmas morning to celebrate these traditions that have become so meaningful to us and our families and to remember again this precious story that we have heard many times over the years. We hear it every year, but it's good for us to hear it and to be reminded that you were at work in all these events. And just as you were at work in the events of the life of your true son, Jesus Christ, so also you are at work in the lives of your adopted sons and daughters, the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. This morning we will add someone to that family here in just a few minutes, and we celebrate that with, with them. But Father, as we go our way here on this Christmas day, whether it be to, to be with family or to, to do other things here today, I pray that you would bless us. And help us to remember this basic story and the basic fact that you are at work in everything and that we can trust your providence. And so I ask all this this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.